This is the Inner Chief Podcast, episode 326. I always ask my daughter, when our head hits a pillow at night, I say to her, what did you what did you win at today? Now, most of us as humans can find a thing we didn't. It's really easy to tell you what's going wrong or challenge. But when you sift and sort through all of the challenges and get to the one thing that went right in the day or that you feel like you won at, and you go to bed at night sleeping on that, you wake up the next day ready to go again, right? Rather than rather than waking up and going, I've got to fix that, I've got to fix that, I've got to fix that. G'day, this is the Inner Chief Podcast, episode 326, and our guest today is Natalie Cook, OAM, OLY, five times Olympian, on how to outthink the competition and why it takes an ecosystem to win a gold medal. I am your host, Greg Layton, founder of Chief Maker and the Council of Chiefs, and I believe there is a great chief in all of us and that through listening to the stories, strategies, and techniques of great CEOs, each of you can find and leave your own legacy through your work. The Inner Chief Podcast is where you will learn how to think and make moves like a CEO. For over a decade, I've helped CEOs and senior executives around the world boldly lead change, inspire their people, and leave a legacy. So every two weeks, I'll bring a deep diving interview with one of these CEOs or another one of a mid to large organization so you can find your own path to greatness as an executive. In this episode, I chat to Natalie Cook. Nat is a five-time Olympian gold and bronze medalist in beach volleyball. She represented Australia in the Summer Olympics between 1996 and 2012. She is a passionate athlete advocate Nat has always been a champion of the transformational power of sport and the life's lessons learnt pursuing your dreams. Her trademark authenticity, energy and ease, combined with her success at both an elite athlete and influential business leader level, make Nat a powerful motivational speaker, strategic sports and wellbeing advisor. Serving as a director of the Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games Organising Committee and holding a position on the World Olympics Association Board, Nat is a firm believer in the game's potential to create enduring legacies for businesses, individuals and society as a whole. Today you're going to hear Nat talk all about the ecosystem of things required to go right for the eventual winning of a gold medal how in competition she used the metaphor of attacking the opposition from the top of the hill, the mindsets and mind techniques she learned being an elite full-time athlete, including how to make the crowd work for you, working with the former Inner Chief guest, Dr. Jeff Spencer, on adjusting to life after the Olympics, and the incredible work she's doing behind the scenes to support not only the Brisbane 32 Olympic Games, but also prospective Australian athletes striving to make the Games. Now, Chief, do you find yourself at work in one of those incredibly stressful moments where you've got someone on your team that either isn't performing or is behaving poorly, and you know deep down that it needs a difficult conversation? One of those ones that can keep you up at night. You know if you get wrong, there's going to be HR issues. But you know if you get right, it could actually be a little bit career-defining. It will make life so much better for so many people, but you just keep putting it off and off and off. Well, Chief, we've created the ultimate resource for you. It is called Difficult Conversations Download. It's not hard, but what's in it is what's most powerful. The mindsets, the frameworks, and even some of the scripts the words to use to make those conversations much more easy. Just go to chiefmakeup.com forward slash difficult and you could download the full resource right there. Chief, before we get into today's episode, if you would like to nominate a CEO as guest of this show, drop us a line with your nominated guest on info at chiefmaker.com.au and we'll check out and see if they are the kind of chief 
we want to have on our show. Chiefs, now let's hear from our incredible guest, Natalie Cook, OAM, OLY, Olympic champion. Righto, Chiefs, I'm here with the one and only Natalie Cook, five-time Olympian, leadership and excellence superstar. Uh, Natalie, welcome to the Inner Chief podcast. Thanks. I'm happy to be with Chiefs. Love it. Yes. Not too many, um, not too many Indians. One cook in the kitchen, which is also me. So happy Chief Day. We need a Chief Day. I think that would be yeah. cool. I like it. I like it. Let's do a Chiefs Day. Um, hey, listen, we've got a great tradition at, at the Inner Chief. We'd love to know where our legends and our Chiefs, where they all come from. Can you tell a bit of a story that sums up your childhood and early days? Well, I started um, very early in uh, Townsville when I was born to my mother, who is an inf- who was an infant swim teacher, and my father was a semi-professional footballer for Crystal Palace in England. So I was sort of oh. destined to be a sporty spice. Yeah. Uh, I started in, in the swimming pool of North Queensland in Townsville, where it's so hot, everyone um, learns to swim. Yes. And uh, I just love sport. I just loved everything going to school early to play with the tennis ball. We were barefoot um, going to school back in those good old days. Mm-hmm. And and I would play with the boys, um, a game called foursome backs, yep. right? So very basic um, game of throwing the tennis ball backwards and forwards, trying to force your team back. Uh, and fly, for those of you that might remember a game, fly where you put your thong down and jump over the thongs and take like musical chairs with thongs. But and for international really... people, that thong for us is actually also a flip flop. So, <laughs> shoe, flip flop. That's right. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. To, the point was, is very basic mm-hmm. sporty games that kept me active. And um, I was a swimmer. I then tried BMX and taekwondo and skateboarding and cricket and kick the footy. And did everything that was um, possible to get out of the classroom, outdoors, and play sport. And um, swimming was the sport I thought I'd go to the Olympics in. When I was eight years old, I dreamt of um, going to the Olympic Games. And I watched one of our Aussie swimmers, Lisa Curry, oh, win a gold medal. Yes. Uh, yes. In the 1982 Commonwealth Games. And I said, oh, I want to do that. And uh, that's how my sporting um, obsession started. Mm, that is amazing. Well, you and I come from a similar part of the world. I've come from a smaller town in Townsville called Ingham, not far away, uh, right up there in the far north of Queensland. So that's a little thing we have in common. Um, tell us about your first ever job. Well, if I proudly say I don't have many, never had many jobs, right? My first ever real job where someone or I had to show up for someone and be paid by someone else was... Um, at the go-kart track, fixing, pulling go-karts out of the wall. Yeah. You know, you buy your 10-minute slot. Yeah. I'd pull the go-kart out when they crash and yep. bang on the tyre rod to make sure the tyre rod was straight and send them on their way. And the reason I chose that job was because I couldn't afford to pay the 50 bucks for the 10 minutes for go-karts <laughs> and I wanted my free go-kart ride adrenaline mm. fix at the end of a three-hour um, job session, yeah. so I never had a real full-time job. I had that was my first ever part-time job, yep. and then I went on to be a um, I won't say it's a professional athlete, a semi-professional athlete as a beach volleyballer. So yeah, uh, yeah, does not well, work full-time well. athlete, right? Was, yeah, but yeah, yeah, full-time athlete. Yeah, yeah. Hey, um, what was your first ever car? Well, proudly, I managed to, what we'll get into further is I was very good at um, selling myself, selling the dream of going to an Olympics, of following an athlete's journey. Now, the point of that is that I sold myself to Jeep and my first ever car was a sponsored car because I couldn't afford a car, right? Coming back to not being able to afford um, uh, much. I grew up in a blue collar family and there wasn't a lot of uh, mm-hmm. discretionary money around. And so my first car was a Jeep Wrangler Maroon, which is the color of Queensland. And I proudly drove that thing for a life. I still own a Jeep. I bought a Jeep many, many, many moons after. Yeah. But my first car was a Jeep. You wouldn't believe it. Our family car 
is a maroon Jeep Wrangler. Oh. <laughs> Unbelievable. Oh Kindred spirits, Greg. Unbelievable. I can't believe you said that. Okay. <laughs> Look, you, you've had this very interesting life and, and, and really... You, you know, you left school and you really did get involved in this journey of elite sport. How did that actually begin and how did you get drawn into uh, beach volleyball? Because as you said, you were, you were going down this track of swimming. How did you find out you were good at volleyball and then be drawn into that as an Olympic opportunity? Well, going completely on a different tangent, golf was the sport my dad wanted me to play. My my mother was born in Ayr, which is an hour south of Townsville. Mm. You know, we talk Ingham. I think it's even smaller than Ingham if we're going to uh, yeah. go there. And the great Kari Webb, who is Australia's greatest ever golfer, mm. was from Ayr. So oh, I, as a, as a, my other sport from swimming was golf. And dad wanted me to be a pro golfer. He wanted to caddy and carry my bag and travel the world and you know that's how we were going to make our money mm. and we moved from Townsville to Brisbane I was still swimming I, I didn't like the new pool I didn't like the new coach actually I'll rephrase that I liked the coach but I didn't like the environment mm. because it was Kieran Perkins coach and I was swimming in the pool with Kieran Perkins at Corinda in Brisbane who's our but oh. one of our famous athletes I was in that squad John Carew. John Carew, Corinda. Greg, what? Yeah. why have we this not met weird. before, Greg? This is weird. This is getting <laughs> weird at people. For those listening on, we're just having a moment. We're having a moment um, This is parallel lives. <laughs> really? I didn't yeah. realize you were in that squad. Yeah, I was there yeah that would have been 88, 89, 90. Okay. I'm there just behind you. That's, that's the reason. Yeah. No, yeah, in, cool. In 97, I was in that squad with KP, yeah. Okay, so well, that's where we got out, right? Um, obviously, if you'd have come, I might have stayed. We might have come back, you know? <laughs> a lot more fun. Um, yeah. But I did. I went to Corinda High. I didn't mm. like the whole routine of at the pool at five. Yep. Swim, school, back to the pool, mm. and let, get home at seven o'clock at night and go again, right? So there. This will get me to why volleyball. Mm. I tried everything. The PE teacher wanted me in athletics and cross country and um vigoro is a sport to look up which was girls wow. cricket because girls weren't allowed to play cricket so wow. i did basketball and tennis and everything mm. then there was a notice on the school notice board that said volleyball trip to canada and america <sighs> and to me that was the sign i raced upstairs to the pe department and i said what volleyball and uh and that's where it started i i a whole other story, but went on that trip, fell yeah. in love with travel, fell in love with mm. volleyball. And ironically, um, Greg, it's really interesting. Most people choose their sport because they're either really good at it or they mm. love it. Mm. So volleyball was the only sport that I felt like I couldn't do. And and I felt like nobody could play. Like if you remember playing school, it hurt your arms. It would go left when you wanted it to go right. It, it, it Nobody could kind of work out how to play this game but that's what sparked my curiosity because everything else I could play to a reasonable mm. level and I'd go to bed at night thinking this game's not going to beat me I'm going to get better at this game and um, that's ultimately what drove my fascination and and desire to get into more volleyball. Mm. So eventually though you end up going a little bit so 96 was the first one is that correct Atlanta 1996? Yes, so the first time it was a medal, a full medal sport. It was a demonstration, which they don't have demos anymore. It was a demonstration in 92 in Barcelona. And then its first Olympic um, official appearance was 96. 96, uh, Atlanta. So the first, we're talking about the, the Olympic journey, but you then did five Olympic games, right? Um when you started out in this going to Atlanta 996, was it even in your mind that this could be three, four, five Olympic Games? Well, where were you at? No, I, I mean, the statistics even now show that 70% of athletes go to one. So yeah. the fact uh, it was about um, wearing the green and gold for Australia, representing mm. my country, traveling the world, meeting new people, yeah. testing my skills at volleyball. Um, in mm. 1993, uh, 
Juan Antonio Samaranch announced the winner is Sidibe, yes. right? <laughs> That, that happened first. There was no idea of Atlanta on the radar mm. because beach volleyball wasn't an Olympic sport yet. Sure. So all of the work had been done at the end of 93. After the announcement, it was announced beach volleyball's first appearance, 1996, mm -hmm. right? So I then had the opportunity. I thought, oh, that's cool. Maybe we can go to Atlanta. Maybe we'll make it. But if we don't, the winner is Sydney. Maybe we'll get to Sydney. Yep. So I knew it was in in to go to one. Sydney was obviously a dream, which which of course now we have Brisbane twenty thirty two, which I'm sure we'll get to later. But that mm -hmm. is now the dream for a lot of our athletes here in mm -hmm. Australia to play in a home games. There is nothing greater than playing in a home game. So it of course was one in Atlanta, and then knowing Sydney's coming after, you yeah. think okay, if I can hang on for two Olympics, this would be amazing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's talk about that little journey there because um, what I'm, I'm sort of interested in is this journey out of becoming a pro athlete and an Olympian. What what changes did you have to make um, personally and about your approach to sport to go from being like a, a good athlete to being an Olympic level, world class, you know, top top ten competitor? Like, can you sort of explain that to people how much of a leap that is? How much hard work and sacrifice? What's that like? Yeah, it really is. Often often I get asked, you know, what's the secret? Uh, there is no mm. magic, um, one magic bullet, yep. right? It, mm. it is an ecosystem mm. of things that have to go right and things you have to commit to to sh slowly get up the ladder. So, you know, there's a lot in there from team. Like Kerry and I started, there were two of us. We didn't have a coach. We realized we needed a coach. Um, to get a coach, we have to pay for a coach. So the idea of, you know, when you write down your list of mm. the things that we need, it cascades into cost. So a coach is going to cost us, you know, circa $100,000, mm. even way back then. And you've got to pay for his flights, accommodation, his, yeah. his wage. Um, now, all this, Greg, knowing I'm not getting paid at this point. Mm. I'm winning a water bottle and a hat and a couple of thousand dollars yeah. So then you've got to engage the whole ecosystem, Australian sport, Volleyball Australia. You've now got to convince Volleyball Australia's um, system hierarchy, CEO of Volleyball Australia, that we're the team, that if you've got any money left over from your indoor volleyball, because that's another part of the challenge, um, there is no single linear line. It is absolutely mm. a roller coaster. And sometimes you think, well, that part will be simple, or easy or a few quick steps and yep. it then turns into you know the biggest challenge of coach the coach is so important so we yep. had to travel to america actually brazil were the best in the world but we couldn't speak portuguese so there's no point getting a brazilian coach unless he spoke english the americans were the next best and they'll tell you they'll be fighting over who they thought was the best but you know from our aussie perspective the American, um, we went to America and we tried to find a coach. So when you start that, probably the, that was a key decision to change our ecosystem, to enhance the team through a coach that would also operate as a mediator between Kerry and I, because we, you know, you can't always be friends when you're trying to be the best in the world. So he became, his name was Steve Anderson. He was just amazing, still is. He took me to four Olympics of the five. Um, he has completely shaped my world and my life. Uh, and after Steve, you then go, so what else do we need in the team? How do we make more money? They're the two things, mm. coaching staff, team, financial. Yep. Um, ideally, Kerry and I would have loved to stay in different hotel rooms. We couldn't afford it. We had to stay together. That puts pressure yep. on things. Mm. So, you know, it's not just an encore. It's not like go and practice at the beach more, right? No, no, no. It, it, is. it has... It All of these other yeah. con connotations. You need your family support. You need um, uh, sponsors to pay for it because ultimately Volleyball Australia mm. did not pay for our performance. It was our, all self-driven, uh, literally driving a Jeep and, and everyone else that was going to be part of it. So mm. once you commit all in, boots yeah. and all, you're not one foot in the swimming pool, one foot out of the swimming pool. You're going to jump yeah. off the block and you're going to go. 
that ultimately drives all the decisions to start to climb the ladder. Mm. I'm fascinated by the role of Steve Anderson uh, as your coach. Um, and one of the things that, that I'm quite interested to understand is um, as you went on this journey of professional excellence and, become, and real mastery in your craft, was there anything quite technical or tactical that really made a difference for you? Like if you think about the journey of consistently going up, plateauing, increasing performance, plateauing, is there anything along the way that went, ah, oh, gee, I really needed that, that, is making a difference and be as technical as you like. Yeah, that Steve, we sort of trusted Steve with all the technical, the tactical. Um, he then had to take on relational. So I sort of look at it like the triangle, technical, <laughs> tactical, relational, yeah. relational Kerry and I. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there were times we weren't the best technical team. But, but our relational and our tactical won out every time. Well, yeah, right. And, and so Steve, you know, whether, <clears throat> whether he sat down and worked out the percentages and what was needed, the mm. end of the day, when you're trying to be the best in the world under pressure, it, um, your relationship is the most important. It doesn't matter how good your dig set spike is, mm. right? Yep. And he, he worked on dig set and spike, but not from a, physical point of view from an outcome point of view. He actually didn't care what your spike looked like if you got your spike in the right place. Sure. Yeah. Now, ultimately, if you, you know, if you, if you micromanage that backwards, he would be watching and changing, but I wasn't conscious of it. I was just conscious of the outcome. Now there's this always this conscious flow of, is it outcome versus process? Uh, and that's a, yeah. a, often a great discussion my belief is you need one eye on the outcome and the goal and the vision, which drives your purpose and your legacy and your passion. And you need one eye on the process and making sure you're taking the right steps on the right path. Is your ladder against the right wall? And then you've got to be physically and spiritually present in making your best deci decisions today that matter for both of those things. It's yeah. quite a, a unique seesaw fulcrum, but yeah. So, Technically, it wasn't, there wasn't a big technical change. It's like ball has to get from here to there. Um, I was very good at physics, very good at maths, very good at science. How is ball going to get over there? It's like, okay, well, let's have a go. Um, yeah. Okay. So that probably doesn't answer your question so much, but he was very focused on the tactics and how to put your, uh, one of his favorite books was The Art of War. Absolutely. And and he made us read that. And he so if you take the, the one philosophy in there, I remember is always attack from a position of height and strength and off offense. You want to be up high watching the valley. You don't want to be in the valley looking up the hill. Mm. So we would often take that intention and that point of view of how do I get myself on top of the mountain here Whilst I'm on court, worrying about dig, set, and spike in my opposition, I need to beat them tactically from the top of the hill and not from the bottom of the valley. And if we ever found at the bottom of the valley, time out, sit down, helicopter up to the top of the hill and get ourselves in, in the best spot. That's beautiful. Yeah, and I think that's exactly what I was looking for, is something just like that to explain um, what made a big difference for you. Now, Chief, do you want to take your game to a new level or that of your people? Our mini MBA in leading high-performance teams now has the highest NPS of any mini MBA-style program in Australia at 91. Why? Because when you do the program, you get immediate and tangible performance improvement. You get dedicated time working on the business as opposed to away from it. We have a practical, real-world approach here. We teach frameworks that you implement in your business as we go, and then you share and learn with your peers and with me as your coach. So the cost-benefit is immediate, right? The weekly coaching sessions are live, and you get a chance to ask questions direct to me and of your peers, and the time management is completely achievable because you're only spending a couple of hours a week on this at max, and those two hours are actually working on the business. So if you want to add something 
that really changes your game. It helps you become a real master of transformation and change and to inspire your people and love your job. Check out chiefmakeup.com forward slash mini MBA. So when you, when you step back now and take that helicopter view and where you consider all of um, the Olympic athletes you ever met, um, but then there's only a few that have been gold medalists or absolute standouts like you, you, you felt so you're McEwen's of the world right now uh, in swimming. Um, is there a distinction between that really good and greatest of all time kind of uh, athlete? Anything in there that you've seen over the years, I think that's the difference. Mm. I think there's a couple of more distinctions in between really good gold medalists. So Olympians, medalist, yep. as I was one of those in 96, gold medalist, yep. greatest of all time, right? So yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a hierarchy. There is a hierarchy and there's a small, when you talk about summiting Everest, mm. there's not as many people at the top. You don't stay there very long because there's not enough oxygen. There's one, there's one route to go. You put your, yeah. uh, you put your best shoes on, you put your oxygen there. And that, it really is about all in commitment but holistically in this whole ecosystem. It doesn't always mean, like I said, Mm. that you have to be the best technically or you have in swimming and cycling and running, you might have to be the fastest and the most powerful. But if you look at Emma McKeon from Australia, our greatest Olympian of all time, yep. she doesn't look like she's the strongest or the, I mean, she looks fit, of course, yeah, but yeah. she doesn't look <laughs> like, like the strongest athlete. And yeah, she's obviously yeah. aerodynamic through the, mm. she's got splits off the pool, her turns yeah. are great, her breathing yeah. stroke, all of those technical aspects. But for me, it's like there in in beach volleyball we say professional am, amateurs do it until they get it right. Professionals do it until they can't get it wrong. So mm. so with volleyball, it's like if I hit a shot down the line and hit the line and go yes, as an amateur, you're like oh I've got that shot, I'm going to move to a next one. Mm. We would train that shot until missing it is is like not in our realm yeah. like if i missed the shot with my eyes closed i would ask the referee to check the ball mark because that's not possible yeah. for me to miss that shot mm. and i think that's the difference if you look at a federer a djokovic a nadal you know their their intensity it's it's we're never perfect but perfect practice or most intense pressure practice all the time not oh wait till i get to the olympics which mm. happens once every four years yep to see if it's good enough it's like how do you train under scrutiny how do you perform under pressure and our coach's job which he did amazing was how does he produce pre pressure moments when it's not you, you can't actually recreate the olympics you can't yeah. that moment happens once every four years mm. With the crowd, the pressure, the opposition. So he had to create pressure environments, even off the court, that would have us feel yeah. that kind of adrenaline rush to have us produce a performance. So mm. it is a unique question and, and, and it's doggedness, it's obsession, it's spirit, it's all encompassing. And you can see it in their eyes and you can see it in their performance. Yep. And I could pick it from a mile away, Greg. <laughs> So let's talk about these pressure moments. Uh, fast forward to City 2000, Bondi Beach. Was anything prepared for walking into that stadium that they built there and the incredible atmosphere? No, because it's <laughs> at home too. Like we have <laughs> never played. We had 10,000 Aussies. Like up until yeah. that moment, mm. I'd had 55 Aussies watch me, right? So yeah. all of a sudden you're in this... Um, stadium on the most iconic beach in Australia, Bondi Beach. The mm. public have now got an expectation. It's in that you're on the front page of the paper. Friends are calling, wanting a ticket. Like yeah. for, if, the day before the final, going, oh, congratulations. I didn't think you'd make it. Can I come to Sydney then? Like, I'm trying to focus here, right? Yeah. Um, so nothing can prepare you. Our first match in the event uh 
we had the public imagine 10,000 people when you hit a ball really well they cheer so it's mm -hmm. like lifts you to the next foot yeah. mm. of height but then when you hit it out they all go oh like <laughs> so now now that burying burying you into the sand another 10 yeah. feet and you got to dig yourself back out so after our first match we had to go to a sports psychologist that was in the village we had to sort of work out how do we manage not only our mm. emotions because we'd worked really hard on our relationship but now we had to manage the crowd's emotions or block them out mm. so Kerry was wanting to block them out and I wanted to manage the crowd so sure. now, now we've got this uh interesting paradox so she's like don't talk to me don't talk to me I'm in a, <laughs> a glass prism makes sense and, I understand and, that yeah and I wanted to be an orchestrator could also understand that. Yeah. Right. So yep. I'm out there mm. trying to G them up when they like go louder. And, and even when we didn't, this was a secret. When we didn't win the point, I would get the crowd going for mm. us yep. energetically. So the Brazilian team was like, well, what, what are you cheering so loud for? They didn't get that point. So I tried to change the energy of the game mm. so that we felt like every time we played a point we won it even if it didn't reflect on the scoreboard yeah yeah so i'm a big believer in winning as a mindset not a score or a result mm. and and we hold it between our ears um as the most important real estate and landscape we have and mm -hmm. so one once we understood how to play the crowd um that became the game you know i could i could close my eyes and hit the ball in mm. it it then became, how do I play the crowd? How do I get the crowd on my team? So that it really felt like there were 10,002 against the two from the other side. Mm. And um, is that your fondest memory? Oh, absolutely. The greatest. That, that last point, I mean, I remember many moments in the match, life's made of moments. There are a few moments in there that I, that are very key, but the ball going over the top of my hands, sailing out past. Now, Kerry does not like to get sandy. These are the bits no one knows, right? She doesn't get sandy. So I'm the one diving everywhere, sand in my mouth, sand in my ears, everywhere. And, she, and she's the one, she tells me, I read the ball well yeah. and I don't need to dive. I'm always in the right spot. So this is important because, you know, when you watch, nobody really understands that yeah, part yeah. she wears a towel in the back of her bikini to wipe her hands off because she yeah. really hates sand yeah so it's like ian thorpe being allergic to chlorine and ian thorpe's yeah. one of our greatest swimmers same yeah. thing yeah. so this last point the ball sails over the top of my hands i'm at the net i jump i turn and i see kerry running ready to die because the last it's olympic gold medal point yeah so she's decided she's going to get Sandy and make an effort. I'm like, don't. It's going out. Mm -hmm. It's just, just you know, like, I thought as it went over me, I thought there's no way she's running for that. We're going to win this thing. And I turn and see her about to get Sandy. So fortunately, she left. She realized she was on the sideline. She pulled her arm back and she let the ball go out. But we're talking half an inch. Oh, yeah, yeah. So part of her wanted to take it because Steve has always said to us, never let the ball, like, I'd rather you play it and win yep. the point than leave it and lose the point. Yeah, totally. Yep, yep. So we're halfway between all that going on, as you can appreciate the environment and the, you know, the moment. Fortunately, she left it. It's the greatest moment of our life. And uh, we still, 24 years on, we still talk about it. So yeah, it's amazing. Bet. Yeah, yeah, that is amazing. A little while back, we were uh, honoured to have on the show, an old coach of yours, Dr. Jeff Spencer, Uncle Jeff. And he, I think we spoke to him for nearly two hours. And um, he spoke about working with all kinds of athletes um, through all the challenges of their career, particularly around moments of doubt. Um, and, how, and in particular, the staying at the top for long periods of time. Um, what did you learn um, from working with Jeff? Well, Uncle Jeff is is amazing, uh, very highly respected in the industry. And I reached out to him kind of, we ended up after Steve, we had Phil, 
who was our strength and conditioning coach. We needed him to also do massage and make sandwiches and do the washing. And so we called him Jack, Jack of all trades. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then we had Curic Ashley, who was our success coach, um, similar to a Tony Robbins style. Oh, yeah, okay. um, yep. Fire walking, glass walking, mm. all of those things. He built our mindset out for Sydney um, and he was very instrumental. Then in, in comes Uncle Jeff further down my career when I needed real expert understanding of more relational, not only to my volleyball partner, but more to the ecosystem. I was struggling within the ecosystem. He helped me understand stakeholders, how to manage stakeholders, how to uh, let go of stresses and pressures that were out of my control. I mean, we've all heard of control the controllables. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I had started to doubt as your the peak of your career comes down the other side, you never want to mark. It's a problem with Everest. You've got to come down. Yeah, right? you do. Yeah. And mm. um, coming down the other side, Jeff helped a lot managing the expectations of myself with others, myself with myself, mm. um, and the doubts of could I go to my third Olympics? Could I go to a fourth? Is it like, who am I to think I can go to five? The young ones are coming. All of this other stuff is going on. So he really helped me unpack um, and get out of the weeds and helicopter up and, and understand my position now as an Olympic gold medalist and as in the legacy of sport. It, it was quite a unique, it wasn't specifically to, oh, I doubt my lion shot is now not there anymore. How do I overcome yeah. that? Yeah. He really helped across the whole playing field for me, um, keeping my confidence high because mm -hmm. even it's an interesting thing when you've, when you've summited and you've got the best in the world and you've become the best in the world, you have an Olympic gold medal and then all of a sudden your results on the scoreboard are not showing that level and, and how do you fight all that? So that's where mm. Jeff helped a lot is champions mm. blueprint. Yep. Um, understanding the momentums and the cycles and just being a, a champion for me and an advocate for me, having someone in your corner and a mentor in, a, in your corner, as you know, as chiefs, you know, when the, when the chiefs are the top of the hill, everyone's looking to the chief and everyone's going, chief, what are we doing? And sometimes I'm there going, I don't know. Uh, someone else take the rain for a little while, right? Yeah, yeah. And so Jeff really was great to provide some of that. I'm like, Jeff, I don't know what I'm doing. Just and he just bring you back in yeah. to reality. Mm -hmm. So you, you've now um, shifting on a little bit from your uh, remarkable Olympic career. Now it's post Olympics, now post sport, and you're involved in all sorts of things from Brisbane 2032. But you also do quite a lot of keynote speaking and consulting around excellence. You have a little framework called Gold Medal Excellence. Um, what are some of the key principles of Gold Medal Excellence for professionals and, and maybe chiefs that they might find useful? Well, one thing we identified pretty early that the gold medal didn't just mean winning a volleyball match, right? So mm. then we had to take that being so narrow to how do we create a gold medal framework for our life? Mm -hmm. And if I'm going to be a gold medalist, I can't just be a gold medalist on the volleyball court. It has to be in everything I do. My business, my family relationships, um, my spiritual relationship, my financial relate, like that whole circle mm -hmm. of life balance, which we're never in balance. We're in an act of balancing, mm -hmm. right? And you get, Yep. Whether you have success, you often see that's where I'm putting most of my time. I'm, of course, I'm having success here because that's what I'm devoting my energy to. So gold medal excellence was a way for Kerry and I and the team, the other three, the five mm. of us, to commit to um, being excellent at a gold standard in everything we do. So, And having the other team members be able to hold us accountable. We've given them permission in that framework mm. to hold us accountable to our standard. So we had the five Olympic rings um, and inside each ring, Olympic ring, we would have a topic. Um, one was our code of conduct. Mm. One was our purpose. 
One was our way of working. Some of that was technical. So our winning yes, ways, yeah. our winning ways was technical parts of the game, what we were going to do. And then the most interesting one was in the middle. And that was what we called our guiding principle question. So didn't matter in what was going on in our life, on the court, off the court, with each other. It was the guiding principle question we chose was how do we make it better? Mm. And the key words are how, which obviously needs a plan. We, because mm. it's all of us together. So my actions can actually help everyone, yep. but also together our actions can lift the boat. Mm. And then um, better. What is bettering? We used to call it better the ball. So my job was to put the ball in a better spot for Kerry. Kerry then had to put the ball in a better spot for me and I had to try and win the point, right? Mm. So so we often, the, the better word was, um, now that's sometimes obscure. Mm -hmm. What is what is better? You know, that so you can break that down. You can oh. go into micromanaging on all of that. Mm. But ultimately that was the framework on how do I leave the, and, and now if you look at our life, how do I leave the sport? How do I leave the green and gold jersey in a better spot? Mm. So that question has actually translated across my whole life under the gold medal excellence framework for me to be better with my daughter, who's now eight. Um, her name is Jordan, named after Michael Jordan, who was one of my inspirations. And so it really is about elevating the whole rising tide raises all ships. Well, the, the gold medal excellence model is to lift to a gold medal standard in everything we do in our life. Mm. Um, I want to talk to you about two more things um, around uh, Olympics. One is um, 2032 Brisbane Olympics and your role there. But then also about, <clears throat> excuse me, your green and gold athletes um, organisation that you uh, launched last year. Let's just start with Brisbane. Um, what role are you playing with the 2032 Olympics? And I, I suppose that I want to link in the, the point you just made there about how, how we ri rise in the tide. I, like I assume we want Brisbane to be the greatest Olympics ever. I know that was Sydney's big big claim, right? Greatest Olympics ever. How, how do we go about that? Yeah. Well, it is, I'm now Brisbane. I've been there a long time when I yeah. moved from Townsville. Um, we are very unique. Australia is only one of two countries, the other being the United States, where we've had three Olympic Games in three different cities. I mean, to have Melbourne in 56, Sydney in 2000, it absolutely is Queensland and Brisbane's turn to shine. And But we also have to make sure that it, it is the whole of Australia get to feel like they're connected to Brisbane 2032. The way everybody thought, um, or felt connected to Sydney 2000. So that's one of our biggest yeah. challenges. We do find people going, oh, it's all about Queensland. It's like, well, it's not. Um, it is if you believe it is, but how do we connect you in? So part of my role, I'm on the board. Mm. I was very fortunate enough, the Premier of Queensland at the time nominated me to be a director on the board. It is a large board of 22. Mm -hmm. And and it needs to be that large because there's lots of work to be done and it and it makes sure that we have a very diverse and inclusive um, of all stakeholders. So I represent not only the athlete voice, which I'm very passionate about, but also Queensland's voice and the whole of, as you heard, one of the things that I do is elevate up and get the helicopter view of the whole ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So from the International Olympic Committee to the Australian Olympic Committee, Paralympics Australia, um, all of the sports, how they feed in, how do the athletes feed in, which I believe they always get it left to last when they should be put up at the top. Yep. Um, so I'm a director on that board and I've been there for a few years. I've got a few years left in my term and um, we'll see if uh, I keep going all the way to 32, but I will be a part of it, uh, whether people like it or not. I'll be <laughs> at, Absolutely. you know, I Me absolutely too. encourage people now, even wherever you are in the world, Put it on your vision board, put it in your heart and soul to be a volunteer, mm. a worker, yep. a business that supplies through the procurement, um, a ticket holder. It, it is just the greatest. Mm. Paris 24 this year, LA 28. 
I'm going to Paris for three months to experience the Olympics and the Paralympics. I've never seen a Paralympic Games. Oh, wow. So, know. yeah, I'm <laughs> super excited. So that's my role <laughs> there for Brisbane 32. Lots to be done. We've got big, ambitious goals around climate sustainability and, and First Nations and accessibility and, and mobility in, in that disability space, um, athletes and sports. And, uh, yeah, there's, there's many, many things to be done. Outstanding. Right, Aid Chiefs, more from Nat in a minute. Now, recently, we continued our best of series by featuring another sporting legend, golf master coach Steve Bann. We spoke about coaching the world's best golfers, turning practice into confidence and the improvement life cycle, all of which applies to the executive world as well. Here's what Steve had to say about focused goal setting. Learn to find out, to, to simplify, find out what works and stop doing stop doing all the stuff, all the filler around it that we think we have to do because that's what's been done in the past. I mean, why are we doing this stuff? I mean, how is it actually helping? So to just filter out all the stuff that doesn't really help us get where we wanna where we wanna go. You can listen to that remarkable and fascinating chat with Steve by going to chiefmaker.com forward slash 325. Righto, Chief, let's get back to Natalie Cook. Hey, look, one of your great passions is, and you spoke about your own challenge, resourcing your own career, is that there are so many outstanding athletes out there who just don't have the ecosystem around them, right? They don't have the coach or the money or they can't get to training or or there's always something there. And so you've started an organization called Green and Gold Athletes. Can you tell us a bit about that? And and maybe um, how can we all help? Mm. Well, you know, the legacy for me, I did 20 years of Olympic sport and now I'm halfway through my 20 years after retirement. So I'm 10 mm. years on. Ironically, I retired in 2012. 2032 will be 20 years on. So yep. You know, look for me to ride into the sunset after the uh, oh. closing ceremony of the Paralympics. Um, but I really do believe that with the rising cost of living and to from Australia to travel anywhere, if you mm. tried to book a holiday, Greg, anyone's tried to book a holiday, yep. the costs are up. I was talking to a travel agent the other day, 40% on flights accommodation, right? So imagine you're a young athlete that's mm. excited about Brisbane 2032, you're yep. a 14 year old BMX rider who will be 22 at the Olympic. Perfect mm. for Brisbane. Yep. Mum or dad's got to go. So now there's two fares. There's, this is for a two week tour of duty in the Jersey. Yep. And it's 20, 30 grand. And so what I have, I see it everywhere from Taekwondo to badminton, um, to BMX, to skateboarding, to water polo, to hockey, to cricket. There is a distinction between those small few sports like tennis, golf, cricket that may have money and basketball, big money at the top, but there's still a lot of challenges in the pathway for single parents trying to send their water polo athlete or their basketball athlete mm. to Asia or Europe for a competition. So that's the problem to fix. How do we then, and, and one of the challenges is there's so many how do you know which athletes to back? Who's going to make it? We don't know. You've got to give the whole ecosystem the opportunity. So with Green and Gold Athletes, I've taken on for the next eight years to be uh, a mentor, fundraiser, supporter. And, and what we're working on for this year, we haven't launched yet, so it's a bit getting close, Greg, is a fundraising challenge that all athletes with the dream and the aspiration to wear the Green and Gold for Australia can enter the fundraising challenge. They'll be matched with businesses and individuals that want to mm. help their journey and mentor and help their fundraising. And the goal is to get all of our athletes to raise their first tour of duty money, which is ten thousand dollars. Okay. Mm. So I'm gonna I'm gonna issue the challenge. We're gonna go with our first hundred athletes with a hundred businesses to raise ten thousand each to raise a million dollars in the athlete economy. Mm -hmm. and the athlete ecosystem and so we're kind of i've got plenty of athletes i've got a thousand athletes ready we need businesses yeah that are prepared to say oh help i'll run a 
morning tea, I'll run a lunch, I'll I'll run raffles, I'll run a golf day, sure. I'll 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 help mentor and set up that financial roadmap. I'll donate some money. All of that is what what we're sort of looking for people to do to say, yeah, I'll help one. Yeah, I'll no. just yeah. We're trying to spread the love. We're trying to spread the burden and ease the financial pain for the next generation in the green and gold. And yes. uh, yeah, that's what I'm trying to work on. Okay, so if anyone wants to get involved with that, we'll put all the links in the show notes just to make sure we can we look. And when when it goes live, let us know. We'll put it through the socials as well. Try and move some people. Fantastic. Yeah, we're pretty close right now. We're like I'm on the edge. You know, when you're building out the new startup phase of yeah. of uh, yeah. businesses, um, we're not for profit. We're tax. Yeah, yeah. We got tax deductibility status through. Yeah through the Australian Sports Foundation and uh, looking for anybody that is willing to support money, time, resources. Mm. Um, because as I've also found there's a lot of chiefs out there that wanted to be athletes, almost made it, showed promise, and then couldn't afford it, so decided they had mm. to choose to go and get a career, law, accounting, it's true. entrepreneurialism. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Actually, so I'm, you... finding a, mm. I'm finding a lot of those guys and – females um when i say guys it's all of us all um, yeah. coming back to say hey i thought i was going to make it in javelin and i didn't quite get there i chose to be a lawyer but i'd mm. be willing to help someone a remarkable percentage of our chiefs were good at sport as kids or at least had an absolute passion for it right and i'm sure it's the competitive nature and the and the and the the flow that comes from that that they really love uh, and that mastery piece, they're so curious. They just want to be better all the time. There's that trait that runs similarly between the two. Well, and as we all know, there's nothing like sport to teach winning, losing, teamwork, compassion, oh, yeah. conviction, competitiveness. I mean, my daughter is eight. She's an only child. We do retyke on a Monday. We do tennis squad Tuesday. We've got yeah. um, swimming and she's in and just learn some individual sports, some team sports. It's really important to, mm. um, and my winning, like my family do not like me because I win at everything I do because I choose to, uh, mm. if I lose the card game, I won the toss or I went first or mine was the, I had Mayfair and Park Lane and you did it. You know, it, it's all a reframe yeah. and, and it's fun and it keeps us on top. And I always ask, my daughter, when our head hits a pillow at night, I say to her, what did you, what did you win at today? Now, most of us as humans can find a thing we didn't. It's really easy to mm. tell you what's gone wrong or the mm. challenge. But when you sift and sort through all of the challenges and get to the one thing that went right in the day or that you feel like you won at, and you go to bed at night sleeping on that, you wake up the next day ready to go again. Right. Mm. Rather than rather than waking up and going, I've got to fix that. I've got to fix that. I've got to fix that. So um, that's one bias, of the secrets. Right? Mm. Yeah. Recency bias. I this coach years ago in, in uh, some long distance running. He always made me at the end of even if it was like a forty or fifty k run trail run through horrendous conditions. I'd be at the end like dying as I, you know. He'd be like, No, 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 you, you can't do that. The last hundred has to be your best. And I'm like, What? I'm cooked. But actually. Do you made a difference? Like I finished that strong. I go back to sessions of John Carew. That that wasn't really in the vernacular back then to even think like that. But you know, if you had to finish the final lap at pace and got out and all felt good, you might have got might have loved training a bit more. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Um and, mm -hmm. and focused on the thing you like to do at the end, right? You've done yeah. mm -hmm. like an ultra is a different thing, but you've done for us in volleyball, you've done two hours of of training when 90 minutes of it might have been a hard slog. How do you finish your last five on top as a winner, right? That's right. Um, yeah. But sometimes when we talk about creating that pressure, one of the interesting things our coach used to do at the end of practice, he's like, right, it's gold medal match point. Go back there and serve. Like, mm -hmm. you're just out of the blue. You never knew it was coming. Yeah. And so you, you get one ball. You can't serve it out and go, oh, can I have another one? No. No. <laughs> like, yeah. Mm. One ball. This is the one. Can you put enough pressure on? Can you make it work? Mm. Can you make it stick? So that when you hear the commentator on Bondi Beach on September 25th, 2000, go, it's gold medal point to Australia. And you're like, oh my God, 
<laughs> how do you stay in the winning frame, not the don't screw it up? Or when you're a golfer, don't hit it in the water. You do not want that. You want, I'm going to take this. This is mine. I'm going to win this. Mm. I want this moment. Mm. Mm. Oh, that is amazing. Now, this has just been remarkable. Uh, and I would love to, to go with you finish with about four or five questions, sort of fast track questions. Okay. What is the number one book uh, or learning resource uh, you recommend for professionals of all types? Well, ironically, it's my first. It's my first ever self-help book called The Way of the Peaceful Warrior by Dan Millman. Yeah. And he, he was a US trampolinist and a gold medalist and uh, amazing. The Way of the Peaceful Warrior. Yeah, gee, I think I read that quite a while back. Early book. Yeah, that's a ripper. Okay. Uh, how do people connect with you, Nat? So all of the socials, um, which take up a lot of my time, but my favourite is LinkedIn. So, of course, okay. in the chief space, LinkedIn, send me a note. Uh, mm -hmm. NatalieCook.com is my website. And then, of course, greenandgoldathletes.com.au, which, of course, like you've said, you put in the show notes. But reach yeah. out. I, I'm i a big responder. I'm a big believer in connection and relationship and networking. Mm -hmm. And uh, if anything's resonated with you today, reach out. I'd love to uh, to get to know you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, um, can you nominate another guest you think would be great for the podcast? There is an amazing lady who I've just met called Juliet Wright, who is the founder and CEO for, she did 10 years as CEO, she's the founder of Giveit, G-I-V-I-T. Okay. And, and it's an amazing organisation around giving. And her story, I just heard it for the first time the other day, Juliet Wright, I okay. can connect you. Yeah, let's try and get Juliet on. That sounds really interesting. Okay, if I could hand you the keys to the, any organisation in the world, you get to be the chief. Can't be anything you're involved in now, but you get to be the chair or CEO of anything you want. What would it be? Well, the International Olympic Committee. That'd be awesome. Yeah, that would be pretty cool, wouldn't it? Mm. Yeah. Okay, that final question, what is a final message of wisdom and hope for the next generation of athletes and chiefs. It is really great at the top. The view is amazing. It is worth it. But I've learned to take as many with you. Gets narrower, right? Gets thinner. Mm -hmm. Take as many with you as you can to ease the burden for us all. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and there is only one chief, the one CEO, but the two ICs, the COOs, the, as many C-suiters, the trusted team. Uh, so get to the top, keep going to the top. It's worth it and take as many with you as you can mm. and enjoy it. The bonus tip is you have to find time for yourself. On a Sunday night, I sit and map my recovery time still. It used mm. to be massage, physio, acupuncture, movie, lunch with my mum while I was competing. It's now golf yoga, uh, pickleball is my new sport. Oh, pickleball. Yeah. Pickleball, you've got to have a crack at pickleball. And then um, massage. Mm. Once a month, you've got to find beach, whatever it is for you, surfing, you've got to put that in for yourself. That's exactly what needs to happen. Even the young athletes coming through, pick a different sport, pick a different activity, make sure you do that weekly, monthly, mm. and never give up on yourself on that. Don't go, that's later. It's yep. got to be for you. Mm. Nat, that's just fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your wisdom and experience and um, we look forward to supporting you through to 2032. Thanks, Greg. Ozzy, Ozzy, Ozzy. Chief, that sums it up for this week. I'm sure you can tell I just really enjoyed that chat with Nat. She's so relatable and understandable. And for someone who has been at the top for so long, I think Nat does a brilliant job of breaking down what it took Get there and stay there. Chief, all the links and show notes can be found at chiefmaker.com forward slash 326. Be sure to connect with Nat. Be sure to follow her work. Be sure to support all the stuff she's doing in helping athletes that need a little bit of support make it all the way to the Olympic Games. Now, Chief, if you're yet to rate the episode and subscribe, I hope you'll do so soon. It helps others see the magnificent value that the chiefs and gurus on the show bring to their life and career. 
So make sure you hit subscribe on your podcast app now. Give it a five-star rating if you think it's worthy and leave a short review about your favourite episode. Righto, Chief. As always, remember to stay happy.